I have batteries somewhere. Hello? Hello? Is this thing on? Must be alive one of these here somewhere. Considering the trouble that Alex Bell and Tom Edison had to come up with the first one, they sure have multiplied. Microphones come in all shapes and sizes because there are several ways to do what they have to do. Now, I was tempted to use this to introduce what a microphone did, but it doesn't. Two cardboard cups connected with a string will transmit sound from place to place, but only if the string is tight. Can you imagine trying to build a telephone system out of this? How would you connect the various phones together at the right time? The microphone changes sound wiggles in the air to wiggling electric current. And that can be carried by wires and switched and connected conveniently. The electrical wiggles can also be recorded conveniently. This is Tom Edison's carbon microphone. It launched the telephone system and modern broadcasting. Inside is a bundle of loose carbon grains. A diaphragm like your eardrum is connected to the carbon grains so that it compresses and decompresses the grains according to the sound waves falling on it. The amount of electrical current that the grains will pass is proportional to the amount that they're squeezed. The wiggling electric currents that this produces are an analog of the sound pressure wiggles that hit the diaphragm. Hello? Hello? The carbon microphone has a couple of drawbacks. The sound waves are forced to do a considerable amount of work, squeezing those grains. This has some mechanical implications that affect its sound. And since it operates by wobbling an external current, it requires a source of external current. Early carbon microphones also required a periodic whack to loosen the grains. This ushered a century of people tapping microphones before they spoke into them. And the tradition continues. This is better. It's a dynamic microphone. It still uses a diaphragm, but it creates tiny electrical fluctuations using a moving coil of wire glued onto the diaphragm. The coil of wire moves in a magnetic field, and the electrical wiggles are produced the same way as an electrical generator. Since the sound pressure fluctuations are creating current by the no free lunch theory, they're still doing some work, but it's a lot less work than in a carbon microphone. Since the currents are so tiny, electronic amplification is always needed with a dy dynamic microphone. Because it doesn't have to do much work, though, the diaphragm can follow the pressure fluctuations more faithfully. The dynamic microphone is the same as a loudspeaker in reverse. Putting Acme's money where its mouth is, or more correctly, putting Acme's mouth where its ear should be, we offer the following proof of that last statement. Hello? Hello? Of course... Anyone who's used a two-way intercom already knew this. This is even better. The electric condenser microphone has just about wiped out all other mics. It's now in cassette recorders and most telephones. The condenser part of the name comes from a long time ago when experimenters thought that collecting electricity was a matter of condensing it. We now call condensers capacitors. You can make a capacitor by holding up two sheets of aluminum foil like this. If you apply an electric potential to the sheets, electrons will run from the more negative one to the more positive one in an attempt to balance the universe. When you take that potential away, the electrons will create an electric current by rushing back to where they were. The capacity effect is proportional to the surface area and inversely proportional to the size of the gap. Early condenser microphones used a 400-volt power supply to polarize the plates. The supply was the size of a loaf of bread, and the sheets were well, a little smaller than this, but not much. Sound pressure fluctuations wobble the gap, and the wobbling electric currents can be detected. The only work that the sound waves do is to move the diaphragm. The electrons and the power supply do the rest. The electric condenser uses a permanently polarized capacitor. There's no power supply. But by a kind of a curious irony, the signal's so weak that it can't even make it through six feet of wire. So all electric condenser mics have an amplifier right inside the microphone capsule. The amplifier does require a power supply, but a simple one and a half volt cell is enough. When the unit's in a telephone or a cassette recorder, the power supply is the same as the one from the device. Electric condenser microphones work incredibly well, and they cost about a dollar retail. 
An aunt of mine once complained that she was annoyed by scenes in movies where the actors were seen in great big spaces, talking. She got distracted, wondering where the heck the microphone could possibly be. Actors often have this, a radio mic. This tiny capsule is the microphone, and the bulky box is the transmitter. This radio mic costs thousands of dollars because it has to work perfectly. It doesn't, but that's another story. See, great performances shouldn't be erupted by a, a tiny piece of static or an occasional hiss. If you can stand the occasional imperfection, the $100 variety is available for your camcorder. The microphone capsule has to be located about here to pick up the actor's voice properly. Although, under the right circumstances, it can even be concealed in the hair. The right circumstances, of course, include having enough hair to conceal a microphone. So, mine's right here. The radio transmitter can go anywhere that it won't be seen. Often it's on an ankle, usually on the belt of the back, or even inside a jacket pocket. If you're sitting through a boring movie, you can always look for radio mics. Look for a wrinkle in the clothing or a lapel line or a piece of sticky tape holding the microphone on. You can also look for the transmitter bulge, and sometimes you'll find this antenna uh, 